This is the astonishing story of how the first man in space was not Soviet or American, but was very nearly British. Britain led the world with inventiveness and creativity throughout the 19th and 20th centuries. So it was not perhaps too much to expect the nation that invented the television, the computer, and later the World Wide Web to have also put the first man-carrying spaceship into orbit. But, as with so many things in bankrupt post-war Britain, it was not a question of inventiveness or creativity, but rather a question of pounds, shillings and pence. Here is the story of Megarock, Britain's short-lived attempt to reach for the stars. The idea for a British man-carrying rocket ship went from pre-war speculation and dreams to a tangible reality in 1946. In a previous video, I discussed how German scientist Werner von Braun created for Hitler the V-2, the world's first ballistic missile. Von Braun was interested in getting a man into space, whereas the German military was concentrating upon bombarding London with his invention. However, in vertical trials, the V-2s had been fired to the edge of space. Famously, on the 24th of October 1946, the Americans launched a captured V-2 to an altitude of 65 miles, carrying a camera, and the first grainy images of space were taken. The British had actually been the first nation to test captured V-2 rockets, firing off three in Germany on the Baltic coast during October 1945 as part of Operation Backfire. An extensive technical report on the V-2 had led British scientist E.H. Ross to propose to designer Ralph Smith of the British Interplanetary Society that the V-2 was nearly big enough to carry a man. This was the genesis of Megarock. Ross and Smith set to work creating the Megarock spacecraft based on the V-2. It was basically a modified, enlarged and strengthened V-2 rocket. The rocket motor remained unchanged, but the tank diameter was increased and strengthened so that enough propellant was available for 110 seconds at full thrust and a further 38 seconds at constant acceleration. The German-designed graphite control vanes in the tail were retained but enlarged and also used to impart a slow stabilizing spin on the rocket. The original huge stabilizer fins and other control surfaces were omitted saving 320 kilograms in weight. This was 10 years ahead in terms of rocket design. In place of the instrument bay and the explosive warhead was a pressurized cabin inside a jettisonable nose cone. The rocket stood 17 and a half meters with a launch weight of 21.2 tons and was considerably larger than the original V2. The cabin had two large portholes for observation, access and egress. Also fitted was a strobo periscope for rearward viewing after the cabin, weighing 586 kilos, separated from the hull of the rocket in space. The later American Mercury spaceship cabin copied the hatch from Megarock. The pilot slash observer would wear a standard high altitude G suit with air conditioning and a parachute. The later American Mercury spacecraft cabin was provided with a heat shield for re-entry into the atmosphere, retro rockets and parachutes for braking and descent. Megarock didn't need a heat shield and used a reefing parachute to provide constant drag irrespective of air density and velocity of descent. Megarock's cabin could land on sea or land and had built-in crumple skirt to absorb some of the shock of the impact. During takeoff, the American Mercury's maximum ascent acceleration was 9G, whereas Megarock was only 3Gs. Launch was from a tower inclined at 2 degrees, with initial acceleration of 9.8 meters a second. 110 seconds of constant thrust would propel Megarock to 46,000 meters. That's 28 and a half miles above the Earth, at about 20 meters per second. The pilot would be experiencing 3G. Actuating the fuel controls, the pilot would progressively reduce thrust and keep the G-meter reading constant. When the air density had reduced to a point where drag was negligible, the nose cone sections would jettison automatically. 
Cabin attitude and rate of spin would be controlled by hydrogen peroxide jets. The pilot would now complete his experiments, turn the cabin stern down for re-entry. Megarock would reach the apex of its trajectory 6 minutes and 16 seconds after launch. Then the constant drag parachute would be ejected in descent at 113 kilometers above the Earth, or 70 miles. It's important to note that Megarock was not just a theoretical design. All the technology existed, and it's been estimated that the first launch could have been achieved in three to five years after 1946. NASA engineers in America who recently studied the Megarock design declared that it was 10 years ahead of its time. By 1951, they estimated Britain could have been routinely putting people into space on a ballistic trajectory. So what happened? The Megarock design was submitted to the British government's Ministry of Supply in December 1946, but a few months later it was rejected and the project was killed. The Labour government of Prime Minister Clement Attlee had decided to focus its limited post-war research resources on aviation and in particular nuclear bomb and power technology. It was the worst possible time to try and sell an expensive spacecraft idea to a tired and bankrupt nation. The Americans and Soviets faced no such economic or political hurdles, and the designers of Megarok stood by to watch Yuri Gagarin become the first human in space in April 1961, knowing full well that Britain could have done the same ten years earlier. Please subscribe and share, and also support my channel on PayPal and Patreon. Details in the description box below.